So today we're going to focus on the supply chain. Our two presenters have impressive backgrounds, doing lots of things within all the complexities of the supply chain. They're going to share some great projects and uh, some ideas and things that save money and improve the efficiency and the quality of supply chains. Darren Samuels is our National Practice Director of Operations at Patina, and he works very closely and often with Steve Abbott, one of our best uh, Patina professionals. Steve's very passionate about the supply chain. You'll hear that today. He writes and speaks often about it. These guys have done some great work for our clients across all kinds of different areas and industries. Um, and they have utilized a lot of other Patina professionals like you on these engagements as well. So I will turn it over to Darren. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, I thought it would be um, good today to start off with a couple of pages about, about our practice, um, what we're looking for, uh, what you can do to get more engaged with us and, uh, and work with us. And also I'll give you a little bit of insight about the kinds of things that we're talking with our clients about, because that's what turns into projects uh, for Patina Nation members. Um, in terms of what we're looking for in talent, so speaking selfishly from an operations and supply chain standpoint, um, you know, we've, we're always looking for operations leaders, uh, people that um, have experience doing multi-site uh, uh, leadership, uh, people with global experience, folks that have been through private equity uh, uh, owned companies and people that have done turnarounds and, and massive improvements in plants. These kinds of experiences are really valued by our clients and it's something that, that we're looking for because of that. Uh, in Manuf, we, uh, we're looking for a lot for logistics people, uh, you know, both freight and warehousing and also looking at, at this from a network standpoint, that kind of expertise is, 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 is in demand. Procurement people, uh, commodity managers, strategic sourcing people, people that understand spend analytics, that do supply-based rationalization, and that have domain expertise either in commodities or in procurement processes. Um, you know, there's a lot of value to be unlocked in procurement with our clients, and we're having those conversations, you know, even as recently as last week with a couple of larger clients. And then um, quality, uh, we have a number of people in the nation that we use for their quality expertise, their auditors, shop floor managers, folks that do PPAPs, help onboard new suppliers, help get programs launched. So that's just some of the roles that we're looking for, the, the kinds of folks that we like to uh, to bring into client situations. A few recent examples, you know, we went out for an operations leader uh, with turnaround experience for a client recently. Uh, we've been looking for someone with maintenance expertise to help us build a maintenance capability for one of our client's plants. We are talking uh, with a client right now about procurement professionals to renegotiate some IT and HR contracts as part of a large business carve out. Pretty exciting long-term engagement. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in our markets and, you know, and, and we'll be looking for people with those kinds of qualifications to, to staff that work. Some things that we're looking for from more of a personal characteristic standpoint, we really value diversity of experience. So people that have done multiple things in multiple companies in multiple situations. Um, expertise in specific areas. So whether it's production technologies, products, regions, commodities, you know, people that go deep in, in one or two things um, that, that, that's relevant to our clients. Um, we're looking for leaders who know how to move the needle and have demonstrated that, the people that have had impact. I really value professionalism in our folks. I mean, you know, people that show up, you know, ready for work, that can talk to um, CEOs, global vice presidents, leaders of businesses, but can also communicate at the middle management and shop floor level. This is very important. And then finally, just really good communication skills, both oral and written. Um, these things make it easier for us to work with you and give you more credibility with our clients. So it really makes everything better. So keep that in mind when you're working with us and when we come to you with opportunities, those things are really important to us and we want to see you demonstrate that when, when, we, when we work with you. Um, let's go on to how to get noticed by Patina. You know, th there's a lot of you guys out there and we're always trying to figure out who the best person is for a particular role or for a particular uh, opportunity. And, you know, we're out there looking for, um, let, me, let me back up. So on your profiles, keep these fresh. You know, I know that you, you know, the people in the nation are always working, they're always learning, they're always growing. Make sure your profile and your data reflect who you are today, 
not who you were five years ago. Uh, it's a little bit of effort on your part, but it really helps us be at, be uh, up to speed on on who you are and what you're doing. Talent bulletins. Talent bulletins are like opportunities that we are working feverishly to find a resource for. So this is like these are these are literally projects that are ninety percent sold. By the time we get the talent bulletin, um, we're looking far and wide. So please look at those. Help us find people, whether it's you or someone that you know. Uh, we need your help and we pay for it. And it's a great touch point for us to connect on something really tangible and exciting. Um, and then finally, just, you know, uh, engage with us. I mean, the local offices do events. Keep an eye out for that stuff. Um, I'm working here with our marketing team uh, in Milwaukee to think of some different and creative ways to engage with the Patina Nation. I really want to get to know our operations people better. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got kind of a running list of folks that we use over and over. I'd like to expand that list. Um, our business is growing. And so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we'll be reaching out um, with some more opportunities to have conversations and, uh, and share information about the firm with you guys. Um, Finally, I wanted to just give you a, a feel for some of the conversations we're having with our clients these days. And this is like what I've personally um, been involved with in my client meetings over the past six or seven months. Um, so the first one is building capability. You know, our clients need to improve what I call the classics, you know, um, inventory, delivery, quality. But they're also trying to deal with new technologies. They're trying to deal with accelerating and changing customer expectations. You know, all of this stuff in the consumer world is starting to spill over into the commercial world. Why can't I have it now? Why can't you tell me where it is and when it's gonna be here? Um, and we're all dealing with that stuff. So, you know, building capability for clients is what we're all about. And that's really in demand. And we talk about that with them constantly. You know, how to get step change reductions in cost and also how to improve market access. And we do that through supply chain operations manufacturing. Talent. Um, talent is a huge deal. I'll give you a couple of interesting numbers. Um, by next year, I mean, 2020 is literally like, it's hard to believe, but it's next year. 48% of the workforce is going to be millennials. And these folks just think about their careers differently than we all did when we were growing up. And, um, you know, they, they have a different attitude about how long they're going to work someplace, how many jobs they're going to have. You got to manage them differently. That's half the workforce next year. Um, but only about 36% of them believe they've got the skills they need to succeed. A lot of opportunity to teach, train, develop, invest, and build capability around a workforce that's, that's getting younger and younger and, and, and needs more, more access to that. And a lot of our clients, um, th there's, a, there's a, a metric out there that 84% of organizations think they're gonna have a, a shortfall in leadership and just leadership candidates. And that opens up, that opens the door for Patina to step into those roles and, and act as an interim or even, even you know, secure a full-time. So there's lots of opportunities in the talent area and our clients are super concerned about it. I'm even talking with relatively small companies like you know, $300 million type companies and they're thinking about talent investments you know, who I'm going to invest in, like individual people that I'm going to, that they're going to rely on, you know, in the next decade when they're no longer a $300 million company, but more of a billion dollar company. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And it, and, and it's a kind of thing that we, um, that we're hearing from our clients all the time. And then finally, um, acceleration. We're just living through an age of unprecedented change. You know, we're probably standing on the edge of the biggest restructuring the automotive industry has ever seen. That's happening. We've already seen it happen really quickly in technology and nobody's immune. And what you're gonna see in the cases that we're presenting today is that getting there early is super important. You know, if you, if you can't move quick, you're just gonna miss the boat. Um, and it's both in terms of value capture because like getting the savings faster means more money overall, but it's also competitive position. So it's more than just saving money, it's getting access to markets and driving revenue growth. And that's what supply chain is becoming for, uh, for our clients. It's a way to get at markets and get revenue growth. So we think all this stuff is super exciting. So when I sit down with clients and we're talking about capability, talent, and moving faster, doing, doing things, 
um, that's when I know that we've we kind of got a tiger by the tail and it's time to get moving. So that's what we're seeing in the markets. Um, so that's a quick overview of operations and what we're doing. And um, I'll hand it off to Steve Abbott, my colleague, uh, who's been doing a lot of great work here at Patina and elsewhere. Steve. Hey, thank you, Darren. Mike, Jessica, thanks a bunch. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity again to bring forward a couple of case studies. Uh, these case studies, again, will demonstrate the broad range of, of Patina experience, uh, not only within across industries, but across the globe. Uh, two of these will be international in flavor, one will be domestic in flavor. Uh, but in each one of these cases, we're looking at a full day event if we want to get delve, delve down into the depth of these analyses and these cases and, and the improvements and transformations made on behalf of our clients. Uh, but we're going to try to do it in about seven to ten minutes each so there'll probably be a lot of questions and uh, we will take them as we can and please uh, follow up as, as Dan and Jessica indicated in forwarding your, your, your information. What I want to try to do also is in summarizing and we'll do it again but there's one basic truism in supply chain, and that is that improvement in management is critical. And it's not just in an up market, it's in a down market as well. As you heard Darren talk about consolidations, uh, supply chain improvements, leaning, material flow improvements, sourcing, bid selection, RFQs, et cetera, that go into shaping a supply chain and subsequently management are all critical issues that as millennials became into a position of leadership, and some of the boomers begin to retire and go to, uh, to, to maybe greener pastures, you're going to be in a position to backfill your, your needs with experienced executives who've got all the battle scars and all the proven mistakes that they can apply to solutions going forward that they've done over the last 30 years. So if you can, uh, we provide a diverse background, and, but we're always ready and willing to learn more. So as we continue forward, I'm going to talk just briefly about our goal, our primary goal in client engagements is to simply deliver rapid improvements and sustainable results for a specific requirement, tailored for specific requirements. The cases I'm going to chat with you here today involve just basically three areas, but they're sort of broad reaching and, and dynamic, and I hope you're going to appreciate them as much as I do. When we talk constraint management, basically it's how you create competitive advantage, perhaps within your, your current scope of business, within your current DNA of your, of your, your operations. I call it basically applied sales and operations planning. It's a key to constraint management and quickly identifying obstacles. How do we identify those obstacles? How do we, if you will, pick the low-hanging fruit and deliver those solutions rapidly to fund future in initiatives, and if, if you will, propel you into the next generation of opportunity? This is another one. It's called Moonshot. I call it Moonshot. I call it out-of-the-world experience. You come into a client, he's thinking what he may need or she may need, and suddenly with the applied experiences and, and the alliances and partnerships that we have globally, we're able to deliver a solution that perhaps a client never thought of. And this is a real solution, if you will. It's exciting. I get talking about it. This, again, could actually take a couple of days to chat about, but we're going to do it in about seven minutes. The other one I call a life-changing event. A life-change event is where you get an amazing result, unbeknownst to you, and an opportunity to capture the, the growth of an explosive market. Uh, I, I put it analogous to a person uh, discovering exercise, a life-changing event that transforms the same body in a wonderful way. So hopefully you enjoy the, the analogies, hopefully you enjoy the conversation, and uh, please, let's get started. If you could, please, as I mentioned, constraint management is applied sales and ops planning. Uh, again, uh, it's perceived to be by many as the mainstream improvement initiatives in supply chain. But in fact, the matter is, it's only one of those particular mainstreams, but it's also very important integrating, if you will, the existing uh, data structures, existing product lines, existing distribution and contracts of existing companies. In this particular case, I'm going to talk about how our supply chain initiatives span all across the program planning and delivery of our final products, not just logistics. So again, the key to constraint management is applying your expertise to quickly identify obstacles and deliver solutions rapidly to fund future initiatives. And in our world, supply chain is a continuum of product planning on through to procurement sourcing, inbound materials receipts, materials manufacturing service con conversion, staging and outbound distribution. And if I go into this particular situation with this case, this particular client <clears throat> was an OEM of commercial vehicles. It had a growing inventory unsold inventory, it had long lead times, and it had potential for pending cancellation of orders. Additionally, the perceived problem was supplier constraints. With this particular client, they had over 60 outside professionals deployed across their supply chain, trying to improve and break the supplier constraints. Very costly and arguably suboptimal. 
our question became as we became engaged is, are supplier constraints really the primary obstacles? Is there a better way? Is there a new capability that's needed to manage the supply constraints? Well, the answer is, as we go to the next page, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because the challenge becomes to demonstrate for the client why and let them set, select a direction that can perhaps change their initial paradigms. So in order of doing that, our approach was really quite simple. We created a small constraint management team, not a group of eight or 10 or 20 sort of consultants. Basically, we had three to four people that came together to basically manage a constraint management team. We basically, we applied what we called the A-team player syndrome. I wanted the best guys, to, as you heard Darren talk about, the people who could think, but also communicate. The people who could do the analytics, but at the same time, boil down those pearls of wisdom that allowed us to get to those heart and soul low-hanging fruits that could be able to deliver value quickly. And oh, by the way, when we had those A-team players, we found our A-team players could manage four and five or six other consultants in the event that they were out there and begin to pair them back as we began to initiate uh, projects and as we began to achieve results we didn't need those those players out there so as a result as we improved and identified our internal weaknesses what did we identify we basically identified that with this particular client <clears throat> it wasn't just a supplier it was the supplier was misaligned for a lot of reasons it was misaligned because of the way we slotted orders it was the way we scheduled production it was the way we launched new programs and communicated edi it was the way we managed our internal buffers because financial pressure to keep non-working assets at a minimal, oftentimes our plants were minimizing their internal buffers and oftentimes not buffering against the uncertainty or movement, not only within the, the supply stream, but also within their own internal abilities to manage materials. And planner training. How was the, the training ongoing? What were the root cause analyses? As a result of addressing some of the internal weaknesses, we also significantly strengthened our external communications and we shored up the weaknesses. Instead of having individual action plans formulated across 63 different suppliers differently, we commonized the standard operating procedure and commonized our operating plans across those 63 critical suppliers. The net result with our A-team is we were able to reduce external resources by 90%. And let me tell you, we did this all in about 20 weeks. So, so Steve, um, so this is as Darren Samuels again. Um, as I recall on this example, one of the talk to us about the um, the relationship with the suppliers and how that changed as a result uh, of this work. They're they're a great question. You can imagine in this type of a turmoil, in this particular instance, it's a growing market, a lot of stress. Suppliers basically were faced with capital decisions, or faced with human resource decisions. And oh, by the way, because of the communications coming from this particular OEM, they were really not real confident that what they were seeing coming at them was really going to occur. They basically, they had no confidence in the communication of requirements going forward. Thus, it was delaying the hiring of staff. It was delaying the implementation of additional shifts. It was delaying the investment of capital to be able to upgrade new equipment and tools. Basically, the lack of confidence on their supply base weakened their supply chain even further because of the history that they had with this particular customer. Great question, Darren. If we, in, Please, and again, if there's any questions, please prop in again. I'm just going to throw you another quick slide again. It says six months or basically in 20 weeks. In this particular event, we saw that because of the external improved communication, not only in terms of what was done with this client and its EDI, but also with the confidence that was gained with the supply base, they actually began using the communication of requirements. They actually began responding to those communications, not just days at a time, but weeks and months ahead of time. They began positioning their assets to better support this particular client. As a result, we ended up with 79% fewer disruptions. There's still disruptions there. There's always work to be done. But in a 20-week period, you move from 79% fewer reductions despite an 81% increase in part number volumes. I'm going to share with you in just a moment another slide that talks about the additional improvements. But again, all of this was done within the existing body. Use my exercise example uh, on a life change event. This was all done without expensive long lead IT solutions. The benefits of this, and just look at the bottom line there in terms of premium freight, reduced by 11%. By the way, as we go forward, that's gonna, that reduction is going to be much greater. And also the operating costs, I don't include in these metrics, but the operating costs also plummeted. This particular supplier with his existing body of business with making a few tweaks and changes actually made a significant movement in their business. So, Steve, do you have any insight around the, the level of like effort it takes to do to, like so on premium freight you know we're talking about a big client complex organization 
just all of the effort it takes to go organize a bunch of special freight, that's its own kind of cost, right? So mm -hmm. what, do you have any insight around like how this just improved life inside the company and the, the way that the staff was functioning? Well, and, and let's put those in two parts because you're exactly right there. Not only the freight, but the operational improvements. Here's the kicker, is when you're able to communicate with your, your suppliers the better requirements and, and they believe in it, they don't wait till the last minute to be able to add the shifts. They don't wait till the last minute to add the staff and to put the tooling or capital equipment in place. So what happens is they're actually positioning their supply chain be better aligned to demand sooner. So not only does the freight begin to fall off, in fact, the goal with this particular client is zero cost per, per unit, but also the operational expense there. So you're spot on. The, the effort to go into that is not magnanimous. The effort basically is understanding the entire business and how it goes together from the way you slot and receive orders to the way that you actually transition those orders and generate your bombs. Uh, maybe too much detail for a seven minute conversation, but, but by and large, tremendous improvement in a very short period of time, largely because of the experiential base of our Patina consultants. Next slide. This is a simple slide, but it's, it basically says the same thing. In this particular supplier, um, a very difficult operation, but basically in this particular, and we call them suppliers, I call them partners. This partner was able to manage and align its supply base along with our consultants to be able to, to, to manage, and by the way, just that just one supplier that's five plants spread across 200 miles of geography in the southeast portion of the US so it's not a simple operation even though a chart makes it appear simple the ability to move material through op 10 all the way through to final distribution to customer was amazing effort and oh, by the way two of those plants out of the out of the five I'm sorry three of the plants out of the five were uh, outside support sources for doing things like heat treating painting and assembly so this was a massive effort, but in the, in the intent, it basically became an example of how you begin to align supply and demand and coordinate, if you will, schedules to be able to be prepared, not only for this week and next week, but the future su subsequent weeks and months. So Steve, this chart starts in April. What did this, what did this supplier's capacity look like in you know, December and January? When we started in December and January, they were having trouble getting to 2,900 a day on a five day basis. In fact, they were having trouble getting to 2,900 a day on a seven day basis. So what we ended up having is we're actually now, and I'll, I'll just say that this slide will be updated. We're actually now in a position where we're receiving 3,600 a day on about a five day basis and have hit as high as 6,500, I'm sorry, per week, 6,500 per week in a, in a seven day basis. So this supplier is recovering. There's still more work to be done. A lot of detail went into multi-cavity cavity tooling, core manufacturing, uh, overall operating schedules, priorities of communication of, of products and times. Uh, again, I could probably talk this one for at least a couple hours if we need if we had the time. We had a question come in um, from what from one of the attendees. Uh, did we consider a just-in-time approach like Kanban uh, that would have given tighter control like Toyota does? Great example, or a great question, but, but let me just offer up because this is part of the communication of requirements and part of the, if you will, the positioning of assets within a supply base. A lot of people get hung up on just in time. Just in time for what? Because what that basically did is it, in many instances across 747 suppliers in this particular client, you had 747 different views of what just in time was. That got into basically shaping their, their psychology and, and, and what is an order to build an order. What is a one piece flow? It's a great question in terms of Kanban. It's a great question in terms of how you might position a particular supplier. It doesn't work across all situations. I think also we're talking about commercial vehicles. These are essentially custom built trucks. Uh, I think for this, for this client, one of their, their high volume over the road truck, I think they can build it one of any one of 5 trillion different build combinations. So I think just in time is fine when you're in a low complexity, um, you know, light vehicle application, but in this world, uh, it's just a little bit different. Well, and exactly, Darren, and this is since you're in a build to order sort of environment from the OEM standpoint. If you have 747 suppliers also doing build to order, you've got to have a uniquely stable fixed firm schedules for a long period of time, in which case that doesn't happen. Yeah, and the complexity of these products is, is literally off the chart Indeed. compared with a passenger vehicle. Indeed, Darren. Yeah. 
So if we go to the next slide, please, and we're gonna to try to scoot through this really quickly. I just only wanna point this out is, is this is just one particular supplier, but basically what our patina professionals do is we basically go through the operation by operation. We begin to understand what the constraints are at each operation. We begin to understand which the bottleneck. We begin to understand where the bottlenecks can be broken quickly by maybe just a simple process change, maybe just different staffing change, maybe it was different tool change procedures. So we go through basically identifying process gaps routing, specifications, operator instructions, housekeeping, layouts, material flow, material handling methodologies that could ultimately cause damage and lost production, cycle times, tool changes, OE, all the things that, as you professionals know, are basically the, the lock stock of what we do. And our diagnostics that go into, again, the OE analysis, the value stream mapping, process mapping, job description, simulation, control plans, layered audits, all the things that we as professionals have done all our entire career. But the question is, is when do you perform those and how do you get the best results the quickest? That comes with the experience that you all have as you manage plants at a higher level for your entire career. So the short story is, Pertino professionals with significant experience can identify that low hanging fruit and begin to implement rapidly. So you're not waiting for a month of Sundays or for another six months to gain a little bit of movement. Oh, by the way, when we do that, we're also transitioning the knowledge to our clients so that not only to get the results sustainable in this particular supplier, they can apply that same roadmap to other suppliers as well. <clears throat> so if I continue to, to just wrap up this particular case study, and this is critically important because this is what we're all about in terms of delivering rapid improvement. With this supplier, with, with this particular constraint example is we had market improvement and improve customer relations. Why? Because you saw on the operational side, despite 48% higher year over year vehicle volumes, we are able to allow a 6% increase in market share because we were able to focus on the products for which we had our greatest opportunity and greatest competitive advantage. At the same time, we were lowering transportation and operational costs with 90% fewer resources. At the same time, the premium freight and all the special work that went into moving materials between 747 suppliers across 28,000 part numbers became far less. The result, your customer relations improved, your customer confidence improved, your supplier confidence improved, and they began to use your communication of requirements. As a result, the KPIs, which I shared a moment ago, all going in the right direction. Steve, this industry is like a lot of industries. A lot of the, a lot of the comp com competitors share suppliers. So we go into a supplier, and they're taking care of our client, but they're also taking care of two of our client's competitors. How did you guys deal with that? in terms of uh, capacity allocations and getting the supplier's attention? We encourage the supplier to simply get better. And we believe that because of the relationships we built with local management and leadership, that we would always, for our clients, be able to win favor. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But at the end of the day, being a supplier, being a manufacturer, you're, you're always gonna, if you will, go to the hand that feeds you best. And with our patina professionals in sight that allows that supplier to get better in service, not only that client, but all clients, you begin to create that relationship that goes beyond just this project and just beyond this client. You're able to be a position yourself as a professional of choice going forward, not only for this client, but for all clients and for that particular partner. Great question, Darren. If I go quickly, and I'm probably running out of time, Jessica, you'll let me know if you would, please. But uh, let, let me talk about what I call the out of world experience. You know, it's setting the enterprise on a new path. I call it the moonshot. Why? Because you never anticipated your capability to do it. Just like the US, if you will, going to moonshot in 1969. Who'd have thought when they launched on that effort in 1962 that they could actually achieve that goal? Well, this is the same sort of thing, a little bit more local than the than, than, than moonshot reel. But uh, overall, it's an out of the world experience. And if we can go through in terms of, I'll cover this quickly. This was actually a, uh, a client engagement that we did uh, out of China. It was a, a Chinese company, again, that had just required, acquired a US-based company. They were seeking capital. They were seeking capital to grow. As the central government was pulling back on funding for uh, uh, SOEs, uh, state-owned enterprises, they were diverting from, from, if you will, basic industries such as automotive and home appliances and apartment and retail. They were diverting more of their funds toward uh, high tech. This particular business giant was in seeking of foreign investment capital. They were seeking a show place to address investors, but they're also seeking an opportunity to improve performance. What they've been very good at in recent years is gr global growth. They've been good at selling and exporting their product. They weren't very good at making money and making wise use of capital. So what we did, and by the way, this was a, this moonshot I'm gonna share with you here, 
was the ability to basically have a massive step in terms of improved capability. But this was phase two. Our initial phase one of this particular project was what we called zero distance. The zero distance project was a scheduling process, a scheduling process that would deliver in four hours in order to build and ship. I'm going to pause for a moment. For those of you who've been in the business a long time, four hours from order to ship. I could receive an order from Vietnam. I could receive an order from Philippines. I could receive an order from the Shandong Northern Province or Beijing, from Hebei or Shandong, from Fushong, from, from Shenzhen. I could receive an order and have it built in four hours and being shipped. Think about that. Problem was, is that we had that capability in terms of scheduling. We did not have that capability in terms of delivery. So phase two was what this moonshot was about. How do we set up this particular high volume appliance manufacturer to have an opportunity to grow and deliver that four hour window? Next slide, please. The supplier was old school. The supplier had typical traditional line flow processes, poor facilities layout, multiple material handling methods, and tremendous amounts of inventory. And because of the poor handling, oftentimes damaged and ad hoc uh, um, uh, containers. It was a basic, basically a mess. So basically, after some time and our, our period of for, for assessments, we put together a project team. We began to analyze the material flow. We began to analyze the uh, overall uh, capability to reposition, if you will, we call it third party logistics. We began to analyze what was actually the core business for this supplier, this partner, this OEM. So again, our goal, our solution was to return this OEM to its core capabilities, that was manufacturing. It was to outsource the non-core capabilities, that being material management and logistics. And it was to be able to free up resources so they could exploit the core business and the non-core capabilities, while at the same time enhancing their ability to move products seamlessly with less distance, less manpower, less cost, less space. If we go to the next slide. So in this particular instance, <clears throat> We built a better supply chain. We established an outside resource to manage our logistics and material flow. <clears throat> we had third party. We basically quoted for nine different sources, and we basically identified whom we could use as a third party provider as an offsite consolidation and deconsolidation center, using RFIDs to track every component, to slot, schedule, and build orders with focus on speed to delivery, less material damage, less in process buffer, or in process buffers sufficient but lower less dock congestion and no shutdowns for physical storage. <clears throat> we initiated the RFQ from nine complete competing third parties and ultimately awarded the business to a Chinese third party. The impact was significant. We basically reduced the delivery loop from less for, for less than 40 minutes from days to 40 minutes. And if I continued on forward, the simulations basically and I won't cover all these details. Our simulations were actually remarkable. 10 different scenarios that involved automatic storage and retrieval, the storage rotational buffers and, and web type conveyor uh, accumulation of materials, all of which tagged with RFID, which I could call down in any particular order to be able to build what we needed when we needed it. So in the event that I got that order from Vietnam or that order from Xinjiang, that order from Beijing, I could build that order and have it on a truck for delivery in four hours. Couldn't do it in all instances, but if the customer required it, we could do it. So again, the lead time in many instances reduced from 45 days and more in many instances to less than four hours. I won't go through all the metrics, but it needless to say, production, because they knew what their inventory was at any given time, they were able to move to, to two days <clears throat> or eliminate two days shutdowns. They used to do physical inventory. They removed their inventory from 50 to 80% reduction. They're able to streamline their operations and staffing by 20% while reducing floor space 45%, standardizing containers. By the way, the ROI on this was eight months. Hey, Steve, we have a question that came in. Just, it's a good one. What type of modeling was used to build, uh, was built to optimize network flow? There were several tools used. In fact, what I did is I brought, uh, we brought a, a consulting group, an engineering design group in out of uh, Farmington Hills, Michigan. And they actually did most of our material flow using uh, using uh, multiple uh, software uh, tools, uh, and we can share that with you at any given time if you if you have a future need. Good question, Darren. 
If I go to the last item, the, the life change event, um, and we're running short on time, team, so we're going to continue to bundle this rather quickly. But the life change event, again, was a major automotive aftermarket manufacturer. An automotive manufacturer had opportunity global growth, but couldn't access that global growth because its, its production and delivery lead time was ranging 120 to 180 days. If we went to the next slide. And in addition, because of that, that, that long delivery cycle and high cost, they were, able, they were refusing orders in areas, particularly ASEAN regions, the nine countries in ASEAN regions from Philippines, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar. Uh, they were just missing a great deal of opportunity because they had no way to deliver product and their opportunity was being lost and their costs were very high. Hey, Steve, I hate to interrupt, but one more question that came in. This is going back to the moonshot case. 45 days to four hours, that's a big improvement. Um, was that an outcome-based contract? I'm, I'm not sure. Or do you wish it was? Yeah, well, well, the outcome-based contract would basically be the price the customer is willing to pay. Uh, so let me explain. We didn't do that for all orders. We had 753 different SKUs that were being produced in this facility. Uh, if somebody in Xinjiang or, or Guangzhou or Hong Kong wanted a, a particular unit, there was a premium that went with that four-hour delivery. Otherwise, it was a basic standard contract that said we would deliver it within 15 days at that point. But I think the question is about the consulting contract. So oh, I'm sorry. When Go we did the work, was it an outcome-based deal or was it more like a time materials uh, sort of, a, of, of an arrangement? It, it was time and materials, but the way we structured the contract is, if any of you have worked in China, you'll understand this. We wanted 30% of the overall contract up front. And we were rebillable the 30% prior to continuing into the, the next phase of the, of the initiative. You want to be real careful when you're working in Asia. You want to be real careful, particularly when you're working in China. Be smart because if you're not careful, you can put an awful lot of work into getting zero or no engagements. And even if you put in a lot of work for getting zero and no, once you get the engagement, you can put in an awful lot of work to get zero or, and no funds. So you always want to structure your contracts to have the commercial terms up front. If you get a contract with a Chinese manufacturer, I can say this clearly, you have won. Because all you gotta do now is deliver because you've already convinced them that you can deliver. All you gotta do now is execute. And that's what's exciting about Patina Professionals. That's what we do. Good question, Darren. Who okay, so, provided that? So back to the life change then. Sorry. So the life change, and I'm gonna try to do this really quickly. This basically was a, a well-known uh, OEM aftermarket manufacturer um, with plants in Arkansas and o Ohio. It was uh, shipping material overseas to Port of Los Angeles. The biggest market was Australia and New Zealand, largely because um, they, they were priced there and they were, they were already in position uh, to be able to grow that market. They've been there for years. What they were missing was getting into the ASEAN region. They were, they were zero in terms of China and Korea. Uh, so basically they were looking for a way to be able to access those markets more rapidly uh, and to be more price competitive despite the recognition of, of, of the brand. So basically we transitioned this particular client to a new model. A very simple slide here, call it explosive growth, but what they were doing basically is they were managing their materials at each of their Ohio and Arkansas facilities. They were keeping the, the, the products going to Thailand, the products going to Malaysia, the products going to Indonesia, the Philippines, Arkansas, New Zealand. They were keeping them all separate in containers. And once they had a full container load, they would ship by rail that container to the port in Los Angeles and they would ship direct to their, their in market location. As a result, they were maintaining a tremendous amount of inventory at their plants before they ever shipped it. And oh, by the way, they were also aging that inventory. Uh, in this particular product line, there was an aging in many of the markets that anything over six months in terms of manufacturing, uh, date of manufacture was non-saleable in that market. So as a result of not only having long delays in inventory accumulations, they were missing the sales and potentially having obsolescence as a result of the sales. So basically our solution was, why don't we just have mixed containers Put whatever you're producing in that particular day, put it in a container, ship that container, you have weekly sailings in many instances, either from Ohio or Arkansas to Port of Los Angeles. So we basically kept our inventory on the water. We set up a, a deconsolidation center in Cebu, Philippines. We direct shipped everything on a weekly basis to Cebu, Philippines. We deconsolidated and shipped less than container loads to each of the individual markets. We basically were able to satisfy orders upon receipt within seven to 14 days not 120 days, not 180 days, not 80 days. And oh, by the way, as a result, we began to be far more competitive in terms of delivering on time at lower cost with any other product in that market. So uh, it was quite a win. And by the way, it was the same body, just operating a little differently, kind of like Steve, the exercise. On, on this one, so this is aftermarket. 
So these aftermarket parts, this is more of a push than a pull in terms of, of generating orders. And is it more about product availability? Um, like if you've got the product and they want it, they'll take it. I mean, what's kind of, what's the dynamic in actually selling this kind of product? The product they needed, and I, I, without getting specific of what type of product, it, it was a perishable product. Typically, each product was replaced within a, oftentimes a three month to six month period. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a transportation product and it's, it's high use. So there was a constant demand for the product. The problem is they could not get their product there quickly enough. So in a way, you're exactly right. It was pushed up to the point of distribution and deconsolidation. It was a pull thereafter. So as a result, we were able to tailor make the orders and deliver those orders on demand because we were pushing what we thought is known inventory. Did we have some excess accumulation in inventory? Sure. Did we have some misses? Absolutely. But the bottom line is that overall, their order fulfillment was greatly reduced, their inventory greatly reduced, and as a result, they accessed markets that actually had upwards of 300%. Now, I will add to this, this was only a solution for the ASEAN region, Australia, and New Zealand. This client subsequently took the same business model and applied it to access to their Korean and their Chinese market, which exceeded their growth even beyond expectations beyond that. That's part of the transition of knowledge that we want to provide in terms of patina resources. Next slide. So if I were to just conclude, I've covered a lot of ground and I, I don't mean to basically uh, avoid you too much more, but let me just conclude. Patina professionals have experience, technical skills, and global relationships to exploit our global opportunities and enhance domestic initiatives. Further, Patina professionals have empathy. I, I, I'm going to talk empathy. It's not oftentimes a, a term that operations guys use because we're oftentimes not very empathetic. But when you've been in a place, you've been in these hard, tough spots, you've been the executive trying to turn a business around, you can feel the pain, you can feel the passion. That's what creates the energy that allows you to be able to go forward in a way that maybe younger people with lesser experience don't have. So when I talk about what we do, again, we provide that empathy. We have been in your shoes as company executives. We understand the difficult positions, the needs, solutions. Patina professionals are not will not complicate your world. Whether real quickly and easily understand your needs and provide a workable solution. That's empathy. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Darren. Jessica. Great, Steve. Thanks a lot. I'll just wrap up here. Um, so if I could leave you with it, just a couple of thoughts about, about the, the content in the case studies. You know, what I take away from this is that, and it's not just that breakthroughs are possible. I mean, you can go into companies and make a massive difference. I mean, move the needle in a big way. But in a lot of ways, they're really required because of what we're living through right now around talent, capability, accelerated change. Um, changing customer needs and just trying to get, you know, an operation and a business to a whole different level of competitive position, profitability and revenue. So in a way, we got to think about the breakthroughs as something that we have to go for. Um, also, uh, you know, fast execution, like getting there quickly is just so important. Steve, you know, some of the themes in, St in, in the case studies that Steve reviewed are about, you know, don't let the IT system get in the way. Okay, your ERP is terrible. Don't wait for the ERP system to come, you know, because frankly, it's not going to save you. So don't let it slow you down. So we look at, when we look at client problems, we're thinking more about, okay, what can we do given the situation? What's the, what's the potential and how do we get to a breakthrough? So we really focus on fast. And then finally, we, we didn't talk a lot about talent going through the cases but the opportunities for these clients to take these results and then build their teams out, enhance their capabilities, get the right people, we help our clients do that. Talent's just a big part of, of, what, we, of what they're doing. So, you know, we tell our clients, make talent part of your strategy. So I think those are kind of the big three takeaways for me from this. And generally, you know, I would just say, when we look at these kinds of problems, we need to go for it. We got to think big. Um, it's not enough to be as good as everybody else anymore. You, you, you need the breakthrough and you, and, you, and you need to get there quickly. Very good. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, I'm glad everybody could join us today. If you still have a last minute question, you can send it in. I want to thank uh, Darren and Steve for presenting and for everybody who joined our call today. And if you have any questions, I'm sure these fine gentlemen will be happy to, to help. 
Um, and if you have any suggestions for future topics in this manufacturing community of practice, as I said earlier, this is our first event. Thought the guys did a great job. And you know, this is your community. We're doing this for you to be able to connect and suggest issues and topics and speakers. Um, and we'll do this on a pretty regular basis. And we've got one uh, community that's got over a thousand members in it already. And that's our coaching and mentoring community. We also have a huge uh, healthcare community. So we're hoping this manufacturing and operations group um, you know, can grow to have uh, as many members as those two. Uh, and we'll be sending a simple uh, survey out if you would just take a very brief moment. I know the world is over surveyed, but I'm sure the, uh, the guys would like to get feedback as would, uh, as would Jesse and the rest of us. So, um, and then I just, we just had a quick uh, question here. Um, beyond automotive, um, what are Patina's major industries for supply chain? So we work with everybody that makes any kind of widget. So we're involved with obviously auto parts companies and OEMs. We also work in medical devices. We work in chemicals. We work in discrete, discrete manufacturing businesses. We work in process manufacturing businesses. Um, so really it's, it, it's, it's, uh, if you look at our major industries, it's probably med device, food, uh, commercial vehicles, industrial equipment, and automotive. Those are the big ones. But then we just have lots and lots of other kinds of manufacturing companies that we work for. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a big, diverse world, and uh, we basically engage uh, everywhere that we can. And Darren, if I might add, within Australia, we've done building supplies. Uh, we, we've also done retail. Within China, we've done nuclear and, and coal power generation plants. We've done alternative energies in terms of solar panels, automotive components. We, we've done a, a host of, of new warehousing and supply chain methodologies and, and uh, uh, if you will, uh, contracting out of Korea, or not sorry, Korea, but in Thailand, Philippines, and also in uh, Vietnam. So our broad range of services are global in, in nature, exactly. Yeah, in fact, uh, Patina is a member of Globalize, which is a group of firms similar to Patina in nature, sort of executive level consulting and operational kinds of work and projects. And so we've got partners in Germany and you know France and all over the place uh, that we can turn to when our clients in the US need help. So, uh, but that's a great plus back to Darren's point, keep your profile at Patina up to date because we wanna know what you've been doing and uh, hopefully stuff has changed from the time that you may have decided to enroll as a member of Patina Nation. So thanks again, everybody, uh, and have yourself a great day. This has been a presentation of the Patina Nation. To watch more content like this or for more information, please visit us online at www.patinanation.com.